Welcome to the clinical case number one solution of the abdomen anatomy. Welcome to a brand new class on DeanMD, where you can learn everything related about the basic sciences of medical knowledge and apply it to patient care in the future or right now. This is the resolution video. If you haven't watched the clinical case, stop watching right now. Because answers will be given, only the important data will be mentioned, and if you missed the previous video, please click here to watch the clinical case. I would like to make some special shoutouts to Catalina Duque and Andrew Salazar for their participation in the clinical case. So what data is important in this case? It's a male 80 years old patient in hospice care with high blood pressure and chronic constipation. He takes enalapril, which is a ACE inhibitor hydrochlorothiazide, a diuretic, and methyl cellulose, that is a bulk forming laxative. He had an open appendectomy due to grade 2 appendicitis, and his brother is diagnosed with Crohn's disease. He presents with intense abdominal pain 9 over 10, abdominal distension, vomiting, and constipation. His BP is 90 over 60, heart rate 110, respiratory rate 22, and temperature 38. This is translated as hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea, and fever. All of these are signs of shock. Also, in the physical examination, he has abdominal pain, distension, tympanism in the percussion, rigidity, and a positive plumber sign. Plumber sign is made by pressing on the abdomen of the patient and quickly releasing. This causes intense pain. With rigidity, these are known as signs of peritoneal irritation, known as peritonitis. When something is inside this cavity, which causes irritation to the parietal peritoneum, it causes peritonitis. To see a video of the peritoneal cavity and learn more, please click here. A study made by Henry Rice, MD, and collaborators in 2007 on pediatric patients established that the presence of Blomberg sign increased three times the likelihood of appendicitis. The percussion in this patient that was tympanic indicates that there is something empty or filled with air inside the abdominal cavity, most likely gas. In the test results, we have a normal complete blood count. These patients can sometimes present with leukocytosis, which is an increase in white blood cells. A systematic review in 2012 established that a temperature of 38 degrees Celsius or an isolated leukocytosis are not enough to determine bacteremia, which is bacteria in the bloodstream. Therefore, an isolated leukocytosis is not enough to determine infection, so leukocytosis can be also caused by non-infectious diseases, even by important emotional or physical stress. The remaining laboratory tests of this patient are also normal. The chest x-ray of the patient shows this black area. If we zoom in, we can see this white area here in pink and below the black area in green. This white area here is the diaphragm. If we compare this with a normal x-ray, we can see that below the diaphragm there is usually white. Therefore, the presence of the black area is not normal. If we see the lung here, it's also black. This is the air density of an x-ray. And by looking at the heart that is white, this is the tissue density of the x-ray. Therefore, this black image is of air density, but where is this air located? It's right here, between the liver and the diaphragm, in a space known as the peritoneal cavity. To see a video of the peritoneal cavity, please click here. Now, let's take a look at the abdominal x-ray. We can see here an strange shape, like an inverted U-shape, that is black, which means that it has air, and this may explain the tympanic percussion on the physical examination. We can also see these white structures that are located in different parts of this inverted U. This white density is known as tissue density, and they look like folds, but as you can see, they don't cross to the other side of the image. So if we take together the tissue densities and the air densities, we get a form like a coffee, the coffee bean sign. And you can compare it here with the x-ray of our patient. The shape is identical, so remember the coffee bean sign. Now let's do a quick analysis of the case. The patient has intense abdominal pain, constipation and vomiting, peritonitis, a possible shock, abdominal distension and a tympanic percussion. 
also air in the peritoneal cavity known as pneumoperitoneum and a coffee bean sign. Now that we have all the pieces of the puzzle, we can, like a detective, figure out what's wrong with our patient. So the first question will be which bodily system is affected in this patient? With vomiting, abdominal pain, distension, constipation, we can easily say that the affected system is the gastrointestinal system. So the gastrointestinal system, it's like a continuous tube. It has an input and an output, and either one can be blocked. So by looking at this x-ray, we need to ask ourselves, where is the gas? If you see the inverted U image, it kind of looks like two sausages. So which structure inside the abdominal cavity is like a sausage? That's easy, the intestines. But now, which intestine, a small or large, has this gas? If we see here, the small intestine has some folds, some wrinkles in it, that go from one part of the wall to the other. They are really thin and they are close together. While in the large intestine, we can see that there are no folds, but instead, there are hostras or little pouches that the large intestine has. Now that we know this, let's compare with this x-ray. Here we can see some levels of air and also in here we can see these white images that cross from one place of the wall to the other. They are really close together like a stack of coins and this indicates air in the small intestine. While if we see this x-ray we can see that these white images don't cross to the other side are more spread which means that there is air in the colon. If we compare this to the image of our patient, we can see that these white images don't go to the other side, so these images show that there is gas in the colon. But the next question that we need to ask ourselves will be, why is it filled with gas? The gastrointestinal system is filled with bacteria, and these bacteria produce gas in the form of CO2 or methane. But if the patient's intestine is filled with gas, it can easily come out, like flatulence. So what is preventing the gas from this patient to come out? Well, it can be an obstruction, an obstruction that can be located anywhere along the gastrointestinal tract. But because we know, thanks to the image analysis, that the affected intestine is the large bowel, we can safely assure that there's an obstruction preventing gas from leaving the large bowel. The bacteria that are still inside keep producing the gas, which causes the intestine to expand with gas. A blockage will also explain the patient's vomiting. When the intestine is blocked, it paralyzes. The movement of the intestine, known as peristalsis, stops. Now, by comparing our patient image with this image that has a distended colon, we can see that they are not equal. In our image, if we compare it to the normal anatomy of the colon, we see that there are epiploic appendages that are made up of fat, the hostra that are saculations or pouch-like structures, and finally we have tinei that is a flat ribbon-like structure located in all the length of the colon. If we compare these white images in our patient's x-ray with the hostras in a large intestine, we can see that they are really similar. And we can also see here that in the base of the inverted U, the gas ends in this part. This reminds me of the balloon animals that clowns used to make. To do them, the clowns twist and turn the balloon upon itself in order to make the shapes they want. For this to happen, the affected segment of the colon must be mobile. So the next question will be, which parts of the colon are mobile? If you remember the mnemonic, said poker, the C was for colon both ascending and descending, meaning that they are retroperitoneal structures. They are covered by parietal peritoneum and therefore they are not mobile, which means that the rest of the colon segments are mobile. To remember this mnemonic, please click here to watch the video. So which segments does the colon have? Well, we have the cecum, the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, the sigmoid colon, the rectum and the anus. The cecum, the transverse colon and finally the sigmoid colon are the ones that are mobile. In this sagittal drawing of the abdomen, we can see that the blue cavity is the peritoneal cavity and every organ that is inside it is known as intraperitoneal and they are suspended by this green membrane known as the mesentery. And if you remember, the mesentery is the one that contains the blood vessels within itself. So if the colon twists like a balloon, the blood vessels would twist as well, causing ischemia, which will cause the death of the intestine known as necrosis. 
The death of the intestine will lead to a perforation in its wall, liberating its liquid and gas contents, and this can act as a corrosive over this green membrane, that is the parietal peritoneum, causing its irritation and inflammation that is known as peritonitis. Also, the gas leaked from the perforation will lead to the pneumoperitoneum found in our patient, causing the peritoneal signs of rigidity and Blumberg. So what is the diagnosis? It's sigmoid bulbulus with intestinal perforation and peritonitis. How do I know that the affected segment is the sigmoid? The coffee bean sign is really specific for sigmoid bulbulus. But what is the sigmoid bulbulus? It's a disease that happens to patients which have a specific sigmoid anatomy. The sigmoid in these patients is long and redundant. The sigmoid mesentery is both narrow-based and elongated. Also, two segments of the sigmoid are close together here in green, which makes it easy for them to loop over the other. Dr. Lucas and its team did a review in 2012. It stated that the most common type of bulbulus is the sigmoid bulbulus in 50 to 90 percent and that it represents 20 to 50 percent of all intestinal obstructions in the developing world while it only represents 7% in developed countries. It's highly associated with advanced age, constipation, and in the Latin American series, with the male gender representing 80% of all patients with bulbulus. One of the reasons that it affects more men than women is that men have a more elongated sigmoid colon while women have a wider sigmoid colon. And finally, it has also been associated with a high fiber diet. Another study done by Aspen and collaborators was a retrospective study that included 230 cases done in a Bolivian hospital. This study stated that perhaps living in high altitudes was one of the causes of sigmoid bulbulus. One of the explanations can be that gas pressure rises when there is a decrease in the atmospheric pressure, which happens at high altitudes. Therefore, the gas that is inside the vowel expands and the pressure increases, causing the elongation and dilation of the sigmoid colon. A research conducted by Koshinega, which included the gathering of histological samples of smooth muscle from colons of both bulbulous patient and non-bulbulous patient, and they discovered that non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic in vitro nerves, when they get activated in the bulbulous colon, they cause an over-relaxation of the muscle fibers, leading to a dilation, which in turn causes problems in motility and further develops the elongation problem that predisposes for bulbulus. Osogi and its team did a retrospective study that included 442 patients and discovered that being pregnant has a negative correlation with bowel gangrene, which means the death of the wall, while a positive correlation exists with comorbid diseases such as high blood pressure, a duration of more than 24 hours of the symptoms, and shock, being toxic or hypovolemic. In our case, the patient presented all of them. Atemanalp did a retrospective study that included 938 patients and discovered that the most common symptoms are abdominal distension, abdominal pain, and constipation. Regarding diagnosis, the coffee bean sign found on plain x-rays helped diagnose 66.7% of patients with volvulus. If you add up the clinical symptoms of the case with the coffee bean sign, it helped diagnose 81.4% of all the patients with bulbulus. And finally, doing a CT or MRI, we can find this characteristic image. As you can see in the CT scan here, it has some gray areas in a specific pattern. What does this image remind you of? It kind of reminds me like a tornado, right? Well, it is known as the Whirl sign, also the Whirlpool sign and CT scan or MRI was helpful in diagnosing 100% of the patients. Hey guys, thanks for watching. And remember, it's always for our patients. If you like this video and the content I make, please don't forget to subscribe, like and share this video. With your help, I'm sure we can get free medical content to every corner of this world.